chamar agora o Brian Child, que tem uma história que começa antes dele nascer, uma história incrível, que começa antes dele nascer, a história dele já estava começando a ser escrita. Mas, para quem não fala inglês e vai precisar de fones, eu recomendo que vocês peguem os fones lá fora, por conta, senão não vai dar para entender essa história. Então, tem que estar com documento, então a gente vai esperar, eu vou, vou conversando aqui um pouquinho, mas a gente vai esperar para começar a palestra até vocês pegarem os fones de ouvido. Brian, se você quiser sentar aqui, a gente vai conversando um pouquinho até as pessoas poderem pegar o, o fone. Então, o Brian, ele, a história dele começou a ser escrita né, antes dele começar a atuar, por volta de 1950, por conta da paixão do pai dele pela vida vida natural pela vida silvestre, no Zimbábue. E essa paixão passou de pai para filho. Mas o pai dele disse, se você quer cuidar bem da natureza, vai estudar economia e governança. E foi o que ele foi fazer. E aí ele vai compartilhar para a gente essa história, que já tem mais de 70 anos, que vem sendo escrita. E que ele vai trazer essa experiência aí que demorou todos esses anos e que parece que tem dado resultados incríveis. O Brian tem uma formação de economia agrícola pela Universidade do Zimbábue e é doutorado pela Universidade de Oxford. Atualmente, ele é professor associado da Universidade da Flórida e atua no The Peace Park Foundation, desenvolvendo governança comunitária, meios de subsistência e economia em grandes paisagens. Ele também desenvolveu, desempenhou um papel de liderança no desenvolvimento do programa de gestões de áreas comunitárias do Zimbábue para recursos indígenas, chamado Campfire. E na Zâmbia desenvolveu um programa de gerenciamento sustentável de parques e conservação comunitário no Vale do Luanga. Assim, Luanga, is ok? Eu sei. Luanga. É, e a aplicação de leis baseadas em desempenho do ecossistema do Grande Cafue. Bom, ele vai ter muita escola para contar, a gente vai esperar só um pouquinho aqui as pessoas retornarem aí com seus fonezinhos, para as pessoas não perderem é, uma parte da palestra. Enquanto isso, eu gostaria só de falar para vocês, para irem preparando as suas perguntas e repetir a história de que o, a, a apresentação está sendo, a, a transmissão está sendo feita no YouTube e também no Facebook do ICMBio. Se vocês colocarem lá no, no Google para procurar YouTube, é, ICMBio, vocês vão acessar o link para compartilhar com as pessoas que não estão aqui, para que elas também possam acompanhar esse evento aqui, muito importante, que a gente está tendo nessa área de parcerias. Para quem está de fora, né, que está acompanhando pela, a gente pelas redes é, sociais, nós estamos realizando aqui em Brasília, no CIBIC, o terceiro seminário de boas práticas na gestão de unidades de conservação e primeiro fórum internacional de parcerias na gestão de unidades de conservação. Esse é o segundo dia né, do encontro que vocês estão acompanhando aí pelas redes sociais. E nós vamos ter agora a palestra do Brian Child, que é professor da Universidade da Flórida. Brian, acho que as pessoas já estão retornando. Você fique à vontade para começar. Quando faltar 10 minutos para terminar, eu te aviso. tá? E a gente vai abrir para as perguntas. Tá? Muito obrigada. Sim, yeah? it's ok. Thank you. Um, morning, everyone. It's my first time to Brazil. Uh, it's very exciting because I'm from the University of Florida, where almost everyone's from Brazil except me. <laughs> um, and I'm going to share with you a long experience of conservation in Southern Africa. And I think there's a lot of scope for South-South sharing, because I think the experiences that come from the North are not always appropriate to what we do. So I'm, gonna, I'm a professor, so we have to start with a tiny little bit of theory. Um, and and as I'm, I, I deal in economics and governance, and Douglas North got a Nobel Prize for showing that the outcomes of society are often dependent on the rules or the governance, and they're often wrong. And so I felt that uh, in conservation, I think sometimes our rules are wrong. That's why we struggle so much. Um, for example, wildlife is priceless, but it's worthless. National parks are worth so much money, but no one ever gives us money to manage them. 
Sometimes we try to create markets like RED and Payment for Environmental Services. The same people block the markets for ivory and hunting and so on. So we're quite confused economically. So, so I'm saying at the bottom there's, there's a mismatch between the rules and the reality and economically conservation is incoherent and confused. Uh, maybe I'm blessed to be an economist. So, so one of the things I'm going to start off, and this is my last piece of theory, is, is that we tend to treat wildlife as a public good. And when it's public, it means that you can't, it's like a view or a mountain. You can't, you can't exclude anyone from it, and it never gets used up. But actually, if you look at wildlife, you can exclude people from it, and it does get used up. Elephants get used up, lions get used up, forests get used up. So treating it as a public good is a mistake. So where did this mistake come from? I think that's what I'm going to talk about now. Where did we start conservation? So conservation really began when white people moved out of Europe and plundered Africa, Latin America, North America, South Asia. So there you can see, whoops, sorry. Um, over hunting in Africa, these are buffalo skulls in America, tiger hunting in India. Basically the problem was white people going out of Europe and plundering. The person who responded to that was Theodore Roosevelt and also the colonial powers, in Euro the European colonial powers. And they set up um, three sets of rules that we still live with today, some of which are good and some of which are not. National parks, as I said, it's America's best idea, even if it didn't originate in America. Um, that Roosevelt banned the commercial use of wildlife, which is something that happens a lot in South America, but not where I come from. And they also put the ownership of forests, fisheries, and wildlife in the government. Um, and so basically, they made wildlife into a public good to try and compete with domestic species, cattle and crops, that are not public goods. They're private goods. And the basic problem is public goods are not competitive, which I'll talk about, and I'll tell you the story about that. So, so looking at wildlife in Africa, I'm from the south here. And humans emerged from Africa 70,000 years ago, and they invaded even to the bottom of South America. And as they did that, they wiped out all the large animals, leaving the only place with more than 10 species of wildlife, big animals, being Africa, where we have up to, we still have Pleistocene wildlife, up to 20, 30 species in one place. You can see that there. You used to, I mean, I'm sure if you were here, you used to have pachyderms and big sloths and everything and where I'm in Florida there used to be 20 species and Australia used to have 45 species all been wiped out by us as hunter-gatherers. What's happening now we're getting the second extinction in Africa so these are the original ranges of the large animals and these are where they are now so wildlife is under serious threat in Africa but not only in Africa if you look at this this is the biomass of wild animals, humans, cattle, and all livestock. So basically, we've replaced wild species with domestic species all over the planet. And uh, maybe 1% of the biomass or 2% is still wildlife, which is not what people in this room want. What are the threats to that? We all get, well, certainly in Africa, everybody gets hit up about uh, illegal wildlife trade. But the, re but the real disappearance comes from competition with domestic species, crops and livestock. And, and you'll see that these animals are disappearing for ivory trade because the price is too high, whereas often wildlife is disappearing because its price is not competitive with cattle or not competitive with soybeans or not competitive. So because when people make the choice over what to farm, they farm crops, they farm domestic animals and not wild animals. So how can we go back to that situation is what I'm going to talk about. So what you'll see in the, here's the human population growth. And the last 200 years, we've moved into all these purple areas. These are the forests and the drylands of the world. They are the marginal habitats. And 
essentially, we, we, we evolved in good... Ag so this is dry, and this is wet, and this is where we can farm. So we evolved in India and Mesopotamia and even parts of Latin America, the, the, the Aztec communities and so on. We evolved where farming's good. But as the population has grown, we've moved out and we've evolved with very simple systems of agriculture. As population's grown, we're now moving into the forests and we're moving into drylands. These very simple systems are not suitable, compatible ecologically with there. But I'm talking, more important, I think, is institutions. Um, things like property rights and markets evolved in places like Egypt and ancient Rome and Athens and Greece in simple systems. So what we have here is we don't know what the rules are. We don't know how to play the game in forests, and we don't know how to play the economic game in drylands, um, which I said there. So do we need to think in a different way about solving these problems? If you look around the world, there's three places that I can, that I can put my finger on where wildlife is increasing. The first one is, is North America. It's wealthy. It's a, if, ironically, in the most capitalist country in the world, they use a communist system to conserve wildlife. It's centrally planned. It's managed by the government. It creates a lot of... It's very well managed, but it's a socialist system. Um, the second place where wildlife seems to be increasing is Northern Europe. And that seems to be linked to communities and forestry and traditional hunting practices. My Norwegian friends have just all been hunting reindeer and, and moose and stuff in the last two months. And they look after it because of that. So there's a big culture of hunting in the forest, so they preserve the forest. The other place where wildlife has increased, and I'll show you the data, is southern Africa. Um, and that's a developing country, um, probably not as advanced as Brazil. Um, and it's certainly not urbanized and wealthy like America. So it's much more the circumstances of the tropics. So there's a, there's a picture of what's happening to wildlife inside parks and outside parks. So imagine in 1970, the jar was full. In 2010, look how quickly the jar has emptied. So West Africa has almost wiped out its wildlife outside parks and in parks. East Africa has lost more than 70%, 80% of its wildlife. Even though everybody listens to Richard Leakey, he comes from there, he's losing. Southern Africa, the parks are good. And outside the parks, outside the parks, wildlife has increased at least five times in the last 30 years. And I'm going to tell you the story. <coughs> Excuse me. There's the same diagram, if you want to reference it. Uh, the slideshow you can have. There's hidden slides with a whole lot of data on it, and I've tried to reference it because it's not familiar probably to most people in Latin America. So why is Southern Africa different and what happened? That's my story today. So just probably a bit like Brazil and so on. Um, the country was settled after Second World War, and there was, the cattle farming was heavily promoted, and tobacco, and maize, and so on. And you can even see it on the stamps so here's, I'm from this country, Zimbabwe, where after 37 years, we've got rid of our president, Mugabe, and hopefully we'll be free again. But I'm talking about this region, which is smaller than Brazil. But you can see that we promoted agriculture big time, and the veterinary department would kill wildlife to make space for cattle. I'd actively go out and put up fences and poison animals and shoot them to make space for agriculture. Does that sound familiar? all over the world. Um, the things changed when we built a big dam called Lake Kariba, which at that time was the biggest, uh, um, biggest lake in the world. And the game rangers, there's my father, he was the first game ranger in the country. They went out and they caught all the animals and they rescued them and put them on dry land. And that suddenly people in southern Africa realized that wildlife was in danger. And this is where everything, the culture about wildlife changed. Um, and people started to conserve it. Now what was happening there is 90%, 95% of the land was being farmed for cows. Drylands, I'm talking about drylands. And it, it looked like this. I actually took this photograph. And that's a game farmer. So these guys were going bankrupt because cattle was destroying the environment and not that profitable. 
And at the same time, wildlife seemed to be much better. It evolved in Africa, lots of species, it was beautiful. It looked to us like it would be a better land use. So how did we, how did we why wasn't it being used? And how did we unlock that? So in the 1960s, uh, they had a big conference in Arusha in Tanzania. And I'll take a quote from here. It said, um, these, the scientists were struck by the, the great number and variety of animals living in harmony with nature. Land carrying domestic animals was overused and degraded. Wildlife was adapted. So why not crop the game? So they thought ecologically, well, African wildlife must be good. The second thing is, if this graph here shows in the white bars cattle populations, and in the black bars wildlife populations in 10 countries in southern Africa. So they, they also said if we don't use wildlife, we're going to lose it. So you've got two things. You've got multi-species are better, and this philosophy, if we don't use it, it's going to go anyway. So, so a group of people, like we heard from the previous talk, came together and they met every year for 30 years. And I've put some of them there, some of these famous people. These are the, 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 the guys on whose shoulders I stand. And they met in what's a, a community of practice and they said, we've got to do something about this. Why don't we give the animals back to the people, to the, to the farmers? Because we as a government, these are all government people, it's not working. We can't manage everywhere. We're dreaming if we think we can manage all the wildlife. We, if we get, but if we can help the local people to manage it, maybe it'll come back. So they started to change the legislation. <coughs> with, my, with my country, Zimbabwe, leading it, they do two things. One, they emphasize protected areas and they manage them very well. Uh, so they actually, uh, you, I heard you talk about legislation. They rewrote the Parks and Wildlife Act and that provided a very strong foundation for national parks. But it also said that it devolved appropriate authority to landholders, which meant that private people owned the wildlife on their land, and so did communities. And this legislation, I think it only happened in Southern Africa on the whole planet, and you'll see the consequence of it. So Roosevelt and them, they said protected areas, good, Wildlife must be owned by the state, and the commercial value of wildlife, we must take wildlife out of the market. The Southern Africans said, that's great, we love national parks, but we'll do the opposite here. Instead of it being managed by the state, it must be managed by the farmer or the community, and instead of having no value, it must have a high value. The objective, they call it the price proprietorship hypothesis, it must have a high price and high ownership, and the objective was to maximize the value of wildlife to the landholder, which is exactly the opposite of what Roosevelt was trying to do. Because don't forget, times are different. When Roosevelt was there, there were less than a billion people on the planet. The world was empty. Now the world's full. There's seven billion of us. So we're using old-fashioned rules. Imagine if we used the same rules for soccer like 200 years ago. As we, it, it would be a different game. We're playing a different game, and we need to adjust to that. So they started experimenting. First, we thought we could make money out of meat. And what we discovered was that you can't, because this is, uh, this is a, a low-value commodity. So even subsistence meat production is not viable. What we realized, and what turned it around was trophy. It's very con controversial, but trophy hunting earns per kilogram of animals 50 times what this earns. So for every, instead of shooting 100 animals, you can kill two and make the same money. So this really drove the recovery of land. It turned, it turned about 20% of our region from livestock back to wildlife. Now once, because basically people were farming cattle and they had a few animals. They started selling them to Americans for hunting and to Europeans, and they made money and they said, oh, let's have more wildlife and less cattle, and more wildlife and less cattle. And eventually they, they turned completely back to wildlife. And then they had to, they'd lost some of the animals, so they had to breed them and bring them back. And so their population became more diverse. And after it became more diverse, then they could add tourism. So now they make double money, because they, they basically photograph the animal, they hunt the animal, they eat the animal. So they're making a whole lot of money. 
And that turned the wildlife industry. Whoops. Oh. So, so I'm just running through the story quickly here as a summary. So when the white people came, um, we destroyed the animals of the frontier. Over-exploitation led to the, the Roosevelt or the London rules. We set up national parks, but the national parks then became surrounded by, by agriculture. And they got island by geography, and they got separated. So how did we, how did we address that? We gave the wildlife back to the people. Private sector worked very well, so then we did it to communities, and so we started to build up landscapes of national parks and private and community wildlife management. And that's where Southern Africa is today. I'm going to skip that slide there. I'm going to skip that one. So I'm just going to show you the data. So Southern Africa is basically a policy experiment on this side of giving the rights to people and making wildlife valuable. It maximizes the value of wildlife to people and it makes wildlife competitive. The counter argument, the counterfactual, the place where policy hasn't changed, for example, is Kenya. So I call it business as usual, it's public management and they banned commercial use. So what I'm going to do is just compare those two um, populations. So here in, in southern Africa, that's the population of rhinos. You can see that in, animals have increased from 500 to 20 million, and here's all the data. We now have a $1.4 billion wildlife industry. If you look in Kenya, cattle have increased, livestock's increased, but the reduction in wildlife is very high. And we all hear about elephants. Elephants have only declined by 40%, whereas most other species have declined by 80%. So it's not illegal wildlife trade, it's markets. <coughs> I'm going to come, and you can see in communities, here's the wildlife populations in, in, in uh, Namibia of different species. They've gone from low to high. So the next thing we need to do, oh, so the basic theory is here in dry lands, so this is dry, wildlife is more profitable than cattle, but because of bad old-fashioned colonial policies, you can't turn that into money. So when you undo the po so you drive the value of wildlife underneath the value of cattle. By changing the policies back, we can make wildlife more profitable and people switch back to wildlife. I'm going to skip that. So now I'm going to talk about what we did with communities. So we tried to do co-management and we tried to do integrated land use planning and all of that failed. I heard people talking about co-management yesterday. We tried to manage wildlife where we manage the wildlife, we gave the benefits to the community. It completely failed. What we decided we had to do, we had to give the wildlife to the people. We had to trust them. So, and that led to, led to campfire. And so we basically did two things. Like when you're teaching your kids to drive, you can't hold the keys of the car and expect them to learn to drive. We took the keys, we took the wildlife and we gave it to the people. And then we, did, then we, we assisted them by, by helping them through training and so on. So campfire wasn't co-management, it was giving ownership to the people. And I'll show you what happened. So that's a typical community, that's the school. When we first started, that was the school. There's the blackboard. You can see the chalk, and there's the new school. They lived here on this community, they were poaching in the national park, and the big conflict between the park and the people. After the program, they had a tourism operation, lots of jobs, and they stopped poaching. I'm going to show you how that happened. The first thing we had to do was we had to earn money. We had to commercialize wildlife. And the way we did that was through, as I said, through hunting. So we had good databases. We trained the community to negotiate with the, the private sector and, they made, and the income went up enormously. The second thing we had to do was to give that money back to the people. So I'm going to skip that. So we, so, and we're dealing with people in poor villages like that. So we talked to them, and they didn't like wildlife. They didn't trust it. Um, they had no... Sorry, you, I've, I've checked my clock, and I've only done 20 minutes. So I, was, I was starting to rush because you said 10, and I'm only halfway. So I'm going to slow down again. So I worked with the leaders, and we had to convince them why do you want to farm cows when you can make 10 times as much money from buffalo? And they said, well, when we sell a cow, 
we take the money and we put it in our pocket. If a buffalo is hunted, that money goes to the government and it never comes back to us. So I worked for the governor and said, what if we change that? What if the buff money from the buffalo comes straight back to you? And I said, oh, you know, we, ne we don't believe that's going to happen. So we did that, and I'm going to show you what we did. Um, in the community, people didn't like conservation. Conservationists always take land away from, from rural people. We're their enemies. We block them up, we poach them, we, we, we shoot them, we arrest them, we abuse them, um, and they don't like us because we don't treat, I think Latin America is different, but in Africa, the local people get it. If there's poaching, they don't catch the, the rich poachers, they're going to catch the ordinary poor people because the other guys are all politically connected and get left alone. Um, and so people didn't like, they honestly didn't like wildlife at all. So we had a big meeting with the district council, with the community, and they said, we're going to treat, we're going to treat buffalo like cattle. Number one, if the buffalo gets shot or the lion or the elephant gets shot in this village, the money will come to that village. Secondly, when you sell cows, you can do whatever you want with the money, so we're going to treat wildlife the same. You can do whatever you want with the money, provided you do it collectively. So we made these two important policy decisions. We went out and uh, we sold the animals to a hunter, and then we came back to the community who had a meeting for four days. I spent a lot of time in communities and meetings like this. So the first thing we had is say, who's the community? What's the boundary? Make a constitution. Secondly, how many? They shot uh, one elephant, ten thousand dollars. Two buffalo, five thousand dollars. How much is that? It's. Thirdly, what do they do with the money? So here they are uh, doing a budget. So this community has maybe earned sixty thousand dollars from wildlife. How much do they want for cash? How much do they want for projects? How much do they want for other things? And I'll spend four days talking about that. You don't want to rush it because the men speak in the meetings, but when they go home, the women speak to the men. And so you've got to do it over two to three days to make sure people understand what's happening. So they make their decisions, then they meet for what's called the revenue distribution ceremony. There is $60,000 in cash coming into the community brought in by the chairman, um, and every, each, each individual, all 150 people come up and they get their $400 in cash because $60,000 divided by 150 household is a dividend of, one, of $400, which for a rural person in those days was a whole heap of money because most people, 50, 60, 70 percent of rural people have no cash. Um, then they, they've decided they also want to do projects, so they tax themselves and they pay back money for the school or the clinic or the water point, they pay it back into the buckets. Then they put the money in their cash, in their pocket, um, and there's the, then they elect a committee. So here's the money in the, in, the, in the bucket, here's the people that have just put the money in, here's the committee that's supposed to implement it. So everything becomes very clear. Everybody signs for the money, and you can see the level of education, it's not very high, um, but everybody's handled the money, so it's what I call the visual accounts, they understand exactly what's happening. Then they have a, often have a ceremony, and here what you can see, they're singing a song about why life is wonderful and worth something. This is a lion, and you can see the $20 notes stapled to the tail. So they've suddenly realized, this is not a, why life is not a non-asset. Wildlife is a financial asset to us as a community. Um, with the money, they, they, they talk with the, the private sector who brings the grinding mill. These people wanted a grinding mill. I don't, know if you, I don't know if it happens in Brazil, but pounding grain by hand is a very hard job. So the women got their grinding mill. Um, and one of the important things, now we start to use the money to develop systems. So every month or every three months, the whole community has to come, and the committee has to present the budget, the actual expenditure, and explain the variance. And if the variance is more than 5%, they're in trouble. So you're now getting a, a financial accountability in the, in the community, whereas before you got a lot of corruption. So you start to develop systems that have proper receipts, double entry bookkeeping, presentation of data back to the community. And we as outsiders have to help them do that. 
And if they don't do that, they don't get the money the next year. So it's, we, it, it's a governance compliance mechanism. And then they also have elections every year. They don't, the leaders want to be elected every five or 10, 15 years, but the ordinary people want to have an election every year. So we hold an election every year. And then the people start with their money to build projects. So before that, they didn't do anything. <coughs> and here, so instead of spending all the money on, on building the bricks, they, they use the money and they buy the roof and they buy the, the steel frames and they start to volunteer. And you'll see here the women are carrying the sand because in Africa that's what women do. And the men are making the bricks and they're starting to build projects. And I'll just show you a list of projects here. Sorry, this is, doesn't always... These are some examples. So there's the old school. You can see it's made of mud. And there's the new school that the community's built with money. These people here, I was driving along the road, and they came rushing out to me. And they said, look what we've done, look what we've done. They were so proud. And they took me to show the house they'd built for a teacher. Because without a house, how, why is a teacher going to live in a rural area? So they, and they'd done it for themselves. Instead of some donor doing it, the people had done it themselves. So you create pride. This example here, the, the NGO project had been talking about a clinic for six or eight years. And it was, I went to meeting after meeting, and the clinic stayed at the level of the foundation. Once the community got their cash, they said, we're going to build a clinic right now. And within six months, honestly, within six months, they built a clinic, and they built two houses for, for nurses. So the community was operating at least 10 times faster than the government. Um, this community, people were dying of cholera every year because they didn't have $300 to build a well. So with the cash, they built their well. And this is here, that's a sign on this clinic that says this, this clinic was built with money from wildlife. So the wildlife starts to push an economy into the area and, and helps the community to be self-governing. Uh, and, and at first they're not interested in wildlife, but within about two years, the community was starting to employ their own game guards and go on patrols. They employed 78 game guards. They, then they bought sewing machines for the women. The women made the uniforms. So things started to um, spiral upwards. And some of the community said, well, we don't have, why don't we have wildlife? Because we don't have water. If we build dams, we'll have water. Therefore, we have wildlife. And they start to invest some of their money in various wildlife things like dams or electric fences or fire management. Or, and they start to actively manage their wildlife. These are rural communities with no education. Um, then once they do that, we start to do training. And I'm showing it's not very complicated. Basically, the people that develop the system are school leavers from within the community. So we train them to do all sorts of, to, to do financial management and to run projects and to do wildlife management and patrolling and so on. <coughs> and, and what the, the theory of the, the system is called loose type management. Um, this is how, how modern firms are managed, loose and tight. So loose, the community has full choice of what to do. If they want to get rid of the elephant, let them. If they want to spend the money on this, that's their choice. The tight is they have to follow proper procedures. So all, because the biggest problem is elite capture and corruption. We have to deal with that problem. So all people affected by the decisions have to participate. You've got to protect the women and the marginal people from the elites. Um, and also you don't want the committees to be in charge. You want the community to be in charge. Um, and the way we do that is each community has a constitution, they have accounts, and they have proper record keeping. I'll run you through this quickly now. But as outsiders, we, we, we impose these conditions, and every year we check if they comply with the conditions. So that's just an example from the one community. So we go through the checklist, and if they can tick all those boxes, that form is signed and the money comes to them. If they don't check the boxes, the money doesn't come. And basically it said, did, was everybody involved in the decisions? Yes or no? Yes, you get the money. No, you don't. Was the money audited and does the community know about it? Yes, you get the money. No, you don't. Did they follow the budget? Yes, no. And did you have elections? If you follow those conditions, the money comes automatically. If you don't follow them, we wait until you follow them. So it puts a lot of pressure on the community to comply. Last thing, I'm going to talk about scale. With, particularly with donor projects, we often put 
communities at the wrong level. So, so we, to save money, we take villages and we elect a person or two people and we work with this committee here. That's what I call representational governance because these villages are being represented. This is participatory governance because everybody is participating. What I'm going to show you is this doesn't work and this is very effective. But we all do this. 95% of projects do this because they're lazy. I call them scale lazy. This is good if you want to farm, if you want, want big systems and you want to look after wildlife, it's good. But if you want equitable benefit of sharing and democracy, it's very bad. It promotes elite capture. So I looked at the systems in Luangwa, in one of the communities, and they did a top-down representational system, and they did a bottom-up. And I've compared them. There's the top-down, and there's the bottom-up. So bottom-up, benefits disappear. The money disappeared. Sorry, top-down. Bottom-up, 21,000 people got cash in their hand. Projects, there were 10. Here, there were 150 projects with the same money. But mostly here, 40 to 80% of the money went missing. When the community was sitting in a circle, less than 1% went missing. So you've got a fundamentally different system when you've got communities sitting in a circle as opposed to their leaders making decisions for them. And I'm going to go through that quickly and then I'm going to stop. So we also surveyed about 150 communities in Southern Africa. And this is the level of satisfaction. Do you trust your, communi your, your community with money? I trust them a lot, and I trust them a little. In single villages where people were participatory, level of trust is very high. In multi-villages, level of trust is low because the money gets stolen or disappears every time. Every time a coconut, as they say. We actually looked at the size of the community. So blue is the size of the community, and red is the percentage of money that it gets used for projects and cash. So that's 100%. So you can see, if you use in small communities, 80% of the money gets used properly for projects and cash. In big communities, less than 10% does. So that money disappears. There's a fundamental difference between big communities and small communities. But we all do this. All the donors and projects do this one. That's why community conservation is sometimes um, said to be in crisis. So I did an experiment, and I sat and I, I was doing training with these with people talking about the stuff, and we we ran a participatory we ran budgeting exercise. So 20 of us being training, and we we then uh, set up a budget where we elected three people from amongst the, the room to make the budget first, and the and only 30 percent of the money was allocated, and people were very unhappy with the process. The same day, in the same room, same people, we made the budget with us all sitting around. Here are we making the budget. More than 70% went to communities, and the satisfaction with the process was much higher. So there's something about humans that we operate much better like this than that. We, if, if you're very bureaucratized and you've got good systems, you can do this. But in rural communities, They've been traumatized, they've been messed up by slavery, they've been messed up by colonialism, they've been messed up by socialism, they're destroyed, and the level of trust is very low, and they don't work at representational level. And the reason, if you look at, there's a plot here, Dunbar's number, if you look at the size of brains of primates, you'll find that, and, and, the, and the group size, you'll find that humans operate very effectively up to 150. After you get 150, you go into regimes where the big guys take everything and the small guys get nothing, like ancient Egypt or the Chinese emperor or something like that. So we naturally operate very well at this level. We've evolved for two, 300,000 years to operate in small groups. Once you operate in big groups, we get exploited. So I think that's the mechanism for, for what I'm showing you. And I'm on 35 minutes. <laughs> uh, it's actually two slides, so I'm cheating here. So, so there's three things to make this work. Number one, you have to devolve the rights. And if you look at Ostrom, the right to use, to benefit, to sell, to manage, to exclude others from taking your resources. Not just the right to money. You've got to exclude proper rights. Secondly, you need to maximize the value of wildlife. 
And thirdly, you need to make sure your communities are working properly at the right scale, which is what I've taken you through. The last slide, the very last slide. So here's a picture from Namibia, which has several lessons. What you've got here is the amount of donor money that went into Namibia. Uh, that's about 10 million US dollars. So they were supporting a program with a lot of money. But this is the economic return from that. So you'll see that the program only broke even after 12 years. What's the average length of a donor project? Five. So you need five donor projects before you get to that stage. So we have to match scale, time scale as well. The second lesson is nothing happened until we changed the legislation, until we gave people the rights. Once they got the rights, look how quickly things accelerated. Sorry for taking a bit long, and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Brian. It was perfect.